Hi, uh, welcome to the NOW presentation, UC Berkeley Past, Present, and Future from a Diversity, Equity, Belonging, and Justice and Staff Experience Lens. Uh, my name is Pam Gleason. I'm a staff member at UC Berkeley. I've been on campus for, oh goodness, <laughs> since 1999, so 22 years. And I'm really excited to be doing this presentation for you. So first I'm gonna um, introduce the Cal Band. And uh, let's listen to this is, so this is a, um, I love this video they made during the pandemic. Um, so thought we'd watch this as an introduction. way to start. I know people were uh, joining as we we're getting started here. Um, I have a really special guest um, for this presentation. I would like to introduce uh, Omar Rincon. Uh, he actually helped me with the uh, GoPro footage and the drone footage. Uh, he was part of the film crew. Um, we did our filming in 2020, um, the same time that that video that was just shown was made. And so um, he's here. We'll give a wave to Omar. <laughs> Um, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad very, uh, very <laughs> humble and um, um, very excited. Uh, we have I had the privilege to go to all these very cool places that Pam will be speaking about, and uh, I encourage you to visit each and every single one of them, connect with the history, understand it, and uh, I left it because uh, it's truly a privilege to be in the epicenter of all of this uh, now. <laughs> Thank you, Omar. Uh, yes, good to have you here. Okay, so I'm going to, so this is first, we're going to start with some dro uh, uh, drone footage. So you can see the stadium, um, the Memorial Stadium holds 63,000, and we're panning over the campus. There's the International House. Um, you might recognize this is in the foreground is the Hearst Mining Circle. And what's going, there's Evans right in the middle of the screen there. And this is panning to the west. Um, so we're going all the way to the west. And this is all campus in the foreground. There's the Campanile. And um, you can maybe see beyond the Berkeley Marina. Um, this was kind of a little bit of a smoky day. Um, but you can see the sun is, is getting low in the sky there. And uh, yeah, there um, that's campus. So I um, thought that would be fun to show you. And that's Hearst Avenue at the end there. And then I also want to show you, and uh, this is really fun because um, you're going to see Omar's uh, shadow because he's the one that um, he had the GoPro uh, camera strapped to his chest and um, he was on his um, skateboard uh, going through campus. Um, we did a whole bunch of shooting and this is one of the longer pieces, but I wanted to show you um, this from, from at the beginning here. So um, Omar's probably going <laughs> to... Recognize his shadow in just a second here. <laughs> oh, I guess it's starting over again. <laughs> See that redwood tree? This is on um, the corner of Oxford at the Crescent Circle. 
And um, there's the Pompadoura sculpture right there on the right. So we're going down the side, but not also on the right um, is Strawberry Creek. So now we're coming up to the bridge that goes over Strawberry Creek. And uh, I like that you can hear the skateboard. <laughs> Campus. So we're heading directly east now. And you can't tell, but the uh, Berkeley alignment we're going to talk about in this um, Omar's back is to the Gold Gate Bridge. So we're going directly towards the Camp Family. And you'll see um, soon, you'll see this alignment come through. Statue football player on the right there. And now we're coming to the Campanile to the center of campus. The life sciences building is on the left. So maybe some of you recognize the places that you work or you've been to this part of campus. We're just going right to the center of campus here. Uh, there's California Hall on the, the far left is um, the uh, library, undergraduate library, and uh, there's the old law school. California Hall on the left is where the Chance Chancellor Chris's office is. <laughs> Now we have the library on the right, the main rock on the left, going straight up to the company. <laughs> Stevens. You know, right now, Stevens is covered with plastic right now because it's getting painted. But in this video, it's Stevens, and then it's the Campanile. <laughs> There's Evans in the background there. Going towards Memorial um, Lawn. That called, also called, uh, they call it the Berkeley Beach, the Memorial Lawn there. Okay, so I'm going to get started with the presentation now. Um, so thank you, Omar, for <laughs> doing the skateboarding to make that and like wearing the GoPro to make that possible. <laughs> okay, so you've probably um, been to many presentations where we start with um, this um, land recognition. Um, so horse touche, which means uh, hello. And this actually, this slide's taken from the Native American Student um, Development um, Organization, but I'm going to um, just read it as, as if I was presenting as I am. Um, and you'll probably hear this a lot um, before conferences, before special guests. It's pretty, it's pretty common now. So we recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people, the su successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familiar descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history um, of the land on which we stand, but we also, but also we recognize the Mawekma Ohlone people are live and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So this is something that we can be really proud of that we have, we are um, really the first place in the world to make this acknowledgement part of our culture here at UC Berkeley. We've been doing it for a few years now. Um, so this is, this is something that we can be proud of. Um, the, um, in, in 1990, um, the Native American Graves and Protection um, and Repatriation Act was, um, was passed. And this was to return any organization or land um, that's related, that's um, owned by the federal government or has a um, relationship with the federal government 
is um, commanded by con Congress to return any um, any artifacts or any bones um, that, that have um, that are on the property. And unfortunately, this is a, a challenge for UC Berkeley is that we um, we have we probably have the third most um, uh, funerary ob objects. Um, uh, um, artifacts and bones um, at, on the campus. So this is uh, sort of like, as I go through the slideshow, we'll talk about things that we're proud of and things that were challenged, uh, that were challenged uh, by and something that we need to get, um, to, you know, to, to um, resolve. And so um, even though we're, we're really great about saying this land acknowledgement, we do really need to um, work with the native people to um, return um, the native, um, funerary objects and artifacts and uh, bones that are that are held in the Hearst Museum. Um, they're in um, a, a basement type area under the tennis courts um, on, on Bancroft Avenue, if you know where that is. Uh, so that's something that's being worked on. Um, just to show you, guess, give you some idea, and they're, we're gonna go through a couple maps just to, to give an idea of where we are. Um, first of all, the shell mounds, um, the native people were here um, at least 5,000 years ago. And um, the shell mounds were built um, as, a, as a, a, a sacred funeral ground. And, uh, and they were all over, you can see um, the, the map um, from 1909 shows um, all those dots are where shell mounds were found. Um, and Berkeley's was the, for sure the oldest, um, by the record, but also one of the biggest. Uh, the photo here is Emeryville, which was probably the largest. You can see how large it was. That's um, pretty much the size that the Berkeley shell mound was. Um, and it was uh, carted away. Um, it was part of, um, as the you know railroads were put in um, and California was being sold as this great new agricultural paradise, um, this um, shell mounds are really nitrogen rich. They're perfect for they're perfect fertilizer, really. Um, and so, cartload by cartload, the shell mounds disappeared, um, including the Berkeley shell mound, which was probably the Berkeley shell mound, which is, um, it's you know, still under if you uh, underneath the ground, it's still there. Um, but it was uh, when it was before it was carted away. The top part was carted away. It was probably about. Uh, four to six blocks long and two to three blocks wide. Um, it's actually uh, right where the fourth center um, shopping area is, uh, fourth street shopping area is. Um, so this is a map that I had made for my research because I wanted to look at some different elements um, together. Um, so you can see uh, the Berkeley campus, um, the rectangle there, um, and then the Strawberry Creek um, that goes through it. And um, this is also um, um, the, the marina, which has been built up. So the, the marina is all um, built up landfill. And it, you can see that there, there where the, the shell mound was. Um, this shell mound um, was uh, probably the oldest because of this alignment with the Golden Gate Bridge. So there's a few parts of Berkeley history um, that um, I'm going to share with you about this special alignment. Um, and for the Native people, it was really a sacred alignment um, because um, there was a belief that um, when one of their loved ones passed, um, that loved one would first go to Alcatraz uh, Island um, here um, for four days. Um, and during those four days and four nights, there would be um, dances and singing to celebrate the life of that loved one going beyond. And then after that, after Alcatraz, which of course is another sacred site here in the Bay Area, um, they, the spirit would go through the Golden Gate and to the beyond and to the, you know, the big celebration across the ocean where all the ancestors were waiting for um, you know, the loved ones to eventually join them. Um, and uh, so this this alignment, um, especially twice a year, which actually this week is one of the times that the sun actually sets right um, behind the Golden Gate. And so it's a spectacular alignment that Berkeley has to have that view. You can't see the opening of the Golden Gate um, from many places except for just along the waterfront here in Berkeley, uh, from the Berkeley Hills, you can see it, of course. Um, but when you're, if you see here, um, 
you know, if you're in Oakland, which is just about here, you won't be able to see that opening. You actually have to see it from Berkeley. Uh, so that makes Berkeley really special. Um, okay. So this was the very, very first map that was made of the Bay Area um, for hundreds of years. Um, captains were trying to find uh, a, a bay where they could get fresh water. Um, this is the time um, when the um, Galilean trade uh, was going from uh, Mexico with all the gold and um, trade route to the Philippines to trade um, for silk in China. And this actually, this whole trade, you know, starting with Columbus in 1492 and onward, um, especially um, with Spain, um, this this actually placed Venice as um, Venice was the richest richest places on the planet because of that trade with the East. But then this new route on the Pacific Ocean replaced the riches of um, the Venice the Silk Road trade route that that you know that that, that made the riches of Venice possible. Um, so the thing about the Pacific Ocean is its wrong name. Pacific means, of course, gentle, and um, the Pacific Ocean is raucous and uh, very dangerous, especially the further north that you go along the California coastline, the more hazard it is. It is. And this was a time um, all the way up until the late, um, um, uh, Captain Cook was actually the one that discovered longitude. And before that, you really had to um, keep an eye on the land um, because otherwise you would get lost at sea. So there, um, a lot of times bo uh, boats were lost at sea or they didn't have enough water or they got scurvy because they didn't know that you needed vitamin C um, in your system to not have all your teeth fall out and then eventually die. Um, so to be able to find a safe place to land was really important um, for all those reasons. So there was there were rumors, and um, um, Sir Francis Drake. It's um, unclear if if he actually did know that there was a bay. Um, they knew about Monterey Bay. Um, San Diego Bay was the first one. So San Diego was part of Mexico, um, which belonged to Spain. Um, and then they were really looking for this um, this opening. Um, that again, the rumors of it. Um, but if you can imagine. Um, if you've ever been on the Golden Gate or if you've ever been sailing out there, um, it's really, really rough water. Um, and also the opening is really small. So it, even in a slow sailboat, it would you would just be seconds. And if you weren't looking there, you wouldn't see it. And plus there's the fog and plus there are the Farallon Islands, which are um, sometimes they're called like dragon's teeth. They're jagged um, islands that are just out, out, outside um, the Golden Gate. Um, in the Pacific. And um, so most captains would be smart enough to go way around those so they wouldn't shipwreck. Um, and uh, if you did shipwreck, there's full of um, great white sharks. <laughs> so you don't really want to go anywhere near them as a captain. So then that meant they were even further from that opening. So that, so for hundreds of years, they just passed this opening. Um, and uh, yeah, and this, so this, this actually, this map was made by Juan Crespi um, I want to go back, um, go back to this. So um, uh, if on this map, I um, show you where the site of Juan Crespi um, camp. Um, so uh, Juan Crespi with the Portola, Portola exhibition, what he was the, um, there were two, two, um, two groups of people that basically walked all the way from San Diego to Monterey. Um, there were the uh, priests, um, who were um, part of the, you know, the mission to bring the mission <laughs> um, to create missions to bring um, the native people to God and to save their souls, basically. And then there was the military, which was the um, established the presidios to um, make uh, um, California part of Spain. And so um, the Portola um, uh, expedition was in 1769, and they basically walked all the way across. And what happened is that they um, they actually overshot Monterey. They, you know, the destination was Monterey, and they went past it. And they went um, to up to a top uh, in, in uh, south of San Francisco. There's a place called Sweeney Point. So Juan Crespi was kind of the really agile, kind of in shape, <laughs> long distance runner type guy who um, was making all the maps and doing all the scouting. Um, uh, Unipacera was his. Um, he, he was his boss, 
um, Father Yuna Pracera, um, but he had a, a bad leg. Um, he had a, a really bad cyst on one of his feet. And so he could not do the kind of adventure walking and, you know, out far out in advance, um, um, trekking far out in advance to set, um, to, to, to mark the territory and to make maps and, and to basically scout the direction to go for the 200 plus and all the hundreds of cattle that were, were making their way across California. Uh, anyway, so they, when they realized that they had overshot and they were a little bit lost, they went to this high point um, in South of San Francisco called Sweeney Point. And um, Juan, Juan Crespi put in his diary that all the ships of Spain could fit into this bay because that's the first time he realized there's a bay here. And, um, and um, so this was a really important discovery. Uh, didn't at that, that point know exactly where the mouth of the bay would be, um, but at that point they needed to get back to Monterey. So they marched back to Monterey, but along with his journal and his maps, um, like this one that we showed you, these went back to the King of Spain, um, King Carlos III, uh, an enlightened king. So he was uh, one of the first um, kings to believe in science and reason. And, um, and so basically it took snail mail, was really snail mail. Then it was, it would take a year to get a communication back from California um, to Spain. But this map, along with the diaries that said, we found this um, bay that could hold all the ships of Spain um, were, uh, it, you know, in that message. So then wait for instructions next. And then, and the instructions are go find the, the coordinates of the opening of the golden gate. Um, so that's that's basically uh, the first footprints in Berkeley were from uh, Juan Crespi and the contingent that went to find where the Golden Gate uh, opening was, and they went to Berkeley. So as we showed from that very first map, that um, Berkeley is where you can see where the Golden Gate opening is. It's at the 38th parallel, and so um, more or less, and so. Um, they went by land and um, the story is that uh, they camped overnight. Um, Alameda, by the way, didn't used to be an uh, island. It used to be um, a peninsula and um, and uh, Temescal River came down, was gushing really huge river. And so they've camped on the side of the river there. Um, and, uh, and the next day uh, they were hungry and they, they a, a couple of the um, the natives were really generous, giving them all kinds of food and everything. But they wanted to get they would, wanted to shoot a grizzly bear because um, that was one of the things they could shoot. <laughs> they weren't very good shots apparently, um, but grizzly bears would yield you know hundreds of pounds of meat, and the grizzly bears were easy to shoot because they're the apex cre uh, um, predator for um, California, and so they would just right, walk right up to human beings, and so. They, what they would do is two or three soldiers would line up and all shoot at the bear at once and then that would become their meal. So they spotted a grizzly bear. A few soldiers went off to, to chase the grizzly bear. Um, and this is all in Juan Crespi's um, diaries. They looked, they lost the grizzly bear. Um, so they heading into Berkeley, um, lost the grizzly bear, but then looked up and then they saw that golden gate. And so they knew they had found this place on the map, the secret X on the map to to know that, okay, this is what the king is gonna be thrilled to know this coordinate because now we can take all of California, we can bring our ships here, we can settle um, all of California and take it for Spain. Um, this was an, um, perhaps maybe the second map, um, <laughs> maybe, maybe not too much after that, but um, this whole, the whole East Bay was granted to one man, uh, Luis Maria Peralta. Um, he was born in 1759 and died in 1851. Um, and so um, his service to King Carlos III in Spain, um, he worked the Presidio in San Francisco. Um, he had a ranch um, in Santa Clara. And, um, and on his retirement, he was given all of the East Bay. Um, so can you imagine one man uh, owning um, 44,800 acres. Uh, and so um, this is interesting to me. You can see this is Alameda. Um, what they're marking here is all the oak trees um, because that was an important research uh, resource. 
You can see the shell mound is marked here. You can see Strawberry Creek. And really um, the way they did maps was to chart the path, what streams they would go across, but also um, they would look at the horizon. So now we look at our phones, right? We don't look at the horizon, but if you, I think that probably most of you don't know that we're right across from the Golden Gate because um, yeah, because we're looking at our phones. <laughs> but um, but I think hopefully now that you will realize how important it is to know where you are in the horizon and that that alignment with the Golden Gate is what is a really special, you know, not happening in anywhere else in the world that I know of alignment. And um, if you were um of this time period, you you would see how special that was. So um yeah, it's just interesting to to think about how that how the resources were were important and how the landscape was um, understood. Okay, and then I have just another map to show this. So um, here we have, um, you'll see the, the missions um, and then they have the Carmel and Monterey missions. And then, um, so the missions are marked here. You can see the little um, cross lines. Uh, we are also right on top of the Hayward Falls. So Berkeley is here. And then the first home uh, ever in Berkeley was uh, Domingo Peralta. He was the son of Luis Maria Peralta, one of the four sons, the, and there were several daughters too. The four sons got to divide up um, the land and um, Domingo Peralta got the furthest uh, Northern section, which is Berkeley. So his home was right here. Um, and, um, and you could see, uh, that Berkeley is also right on top of the Hayward Fault, which is why we have the bay, which is why the formation works like this. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's part of it. And then Sweeney Point somewhere around here. So this is this is where they noticed the bay in the first place. Um, okay. And so this alignment was also why you see Berkeley was set on this land, Berkeley. Um, and Berkeley is named after George Barkley. Uh, George Barclay um, was, uh, he was an abolitionist and his dream was to have a university of Berkeley, well, Barclay is how he, his name was pronounced, but um, Barclay University in Barbados. And so he had a really big campaign to talk about sort of the, the honor of bringing Christianity um, to um, to people who did, who was otherwise their souls wouldn't be saved. So Christianity and education were really intertwined in, in the in 1700s and 1800s. There were, you know, universities were places of um, studying um, uh, to be, you know, to be part of the clergy. Um, and one of his poems, um, this one um, is the last, one of the stanzas of his poem, um, Prospect of Planting Arts and Learning in America. So America, yeah, 1726, he was thinking of Barbados, not um, what we know of America, um, United States. Um, but westward, the course of empire take, takes its way. The first four acts already passed. A fifth shall close the drama uh, with the day. Time's noblest off offspring is the last. So this idea is that Manifest Destiny has taken um, uh, Christianity and learning all the way across the continent of the United States. And now it's going to go to very new, you know, new places. This is also a reference to the apocalypse, the idea that once Christianity spreads all through the planet, then those who are saved go to heaven. And then, you know, there's a apocalypse, uh, ap apocalypse happens on earth. Anyways, kind of dark, actually, when you think about it like this, what, but this was an inspiration for, it was like a call to spread Christianity. And then the reason that the founders uh, from Founders Rock um, use this to claim this territory and call it um, Berkeley, again, the mispronunciation, but Berkeley is because they thought, okay, here we are all the way in the Western part of the continent. We've brought our education, our Christianity. Now we can see through the Golden Gate, we can see the East beyond, and we can see that um, we can continue with our education and Christianity by looking at the Golden Gate, we can see um, you know, China and Japan and all the East that's ready for us to spread our way. And this was also, um, so this poem was in the 1700s. And by the way, um, George Barclay never ended up getting to Barbados at all. Um, he didn't end up raising the money that he hoped. Um, he actually ended up 
um, selling pine tar when he got back to um, the UK. Um, so he, um, pine tar was something medicinal that the natives um, here in America had. And so he was sell selling it as a medicinal thing to make money um, when he went back to England, to Oxford. Um, but anyway, that this was in this poem was printed uh, hundreds of times on the East Coast during the spread of um, the American frontier from the East to the West. And so um, many um, pe people in the uh, late 1700s and the 1800s would be familiar with this poem. Um, uh, and uh, as you know, 1868 was our uh, uh, UC Berkeley's founding. So this was um, uh, the founders really thought, OK, this is a great name because it really shows this ambition to bring Christianity and education um, not only to California, but beyond to the rest of the world. Here are the first, um, uh, you can see um, <laughs> the first two buildings on campus. Um, so in 1873, and you can still see the, um, so we we know you might recognize South Hall. So this is, um, they were both built at the same time, both completed in 1873. And um, South Hall is uh, sciences and North Hall is letters. So here we have letters and sciences. So that might sound familiar. Berkeley has 42,000 students, over 42,000 students now. Um, and letters and sciences is the biggest college, I think with something like 24, 25,000 students now. Um, but the, the, if you think about the College of Letters and Sciences, you might realize that it's because there was letters at South Hall. So that humanities and languages and um, history and English and um, law, um, all part of letters. So this was, um, and then sciences. This is part of the legacy of the land grant uh, university. Um, so land grant universities during the Civil War, this is um, uh, President Lincoln, um, and um, Senator uh, Morrill, uh, the Morrill Land Grant was formed in um, 1862. And the idea was, this was an idea to make the, um, the United States a superpower um, by learning, uh, by having a middle-class uh, learn the sciences that would, that would bring um, the United States to prominence. So there were sciences at universities in Germany, but it's pretty much across the United States um, universities were just for letters. Uh, so the idea of bringing sciences was to, was first to uh, engage the middle class in professions, but also to, um, it was, uh, if you know, Texas A&M is agriculture and mining. Um, it's actually um, mechanics, mining, and military. So there's actually um, A&M and m and m and m and m and m And so Berkeley was one of the, um, was the site uh, chosen for um, this um, land grant, which is basically selling uh, California land was sold to the federal government. And then the um, California state would have that money to purchase territory through eminent domain. So um, state of California can take any land that they want um, for the university site. And so this was the land that they decided to take uh, Founders Rock is something right, like right up here. Um, so the stadium, this is Strawberry Canyon. So the stadium is now in this area here. Um, this is the uh, um, Hearst and the uh, Telegraph. Um, so this, you can see this line, that's basically Hearst Avenue, basically right there. Um, and the Hill Campus, of course, is up here now. Um, and the the big the great the big C was created in 1905. Um, so when campus was created, this is sort of the still Wild West type times. And um, and one of the things that the student body used to do is they used to have a big um, fist fight um, to take over Charter Hill ab above the, above the campus here. And they would you know people would break their arms and people would get you know their nose bashed in. And they the freshmen and the sophomores would have this big fight to who could take over. Um, Charter Hill on the beginning of classes. Um, so it was a it was a tradition. And so they decided that that wasn't the best look to have, you know, all of their students fighting on the hill <laughs> at the beginning. Um, and uh, and so the idea of building the big C was that the classes, um, um, I think it was 1904, 1905, the freshman and sophomore classes, instead of brawling on the, top, the hill together, they together created 
the big C on the hill. Also notice how few trees there were. All the eucalyptus and everything was was planted around this time as a way for people to mark their 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 land. Um, so that those uh, non-native species were brought here. And if you look at the big C now, there's all kinds of trees around, but it wasn't originally like this. This landscape is more like natural to California without the trees with just oaks and rolling hills. Um, okay, so this is a map, one of another uh, original map of Berkeley, and you can see um, this, you know, juxtaposition with the Golden Gate. You can also see the pride in industry, all the smoke. Like it's not something we're you know super pride of now, is like all the pollution, but that this was a time when um, when Berkeley was just growing, and it was really important to show all the industry here um, and to show the the railroads. I don't know if you can see these two um, big streams of smokes are from the railroads. Um, and then you can see Mount Tam here, Richmond, um, and then houses are starting to spread to the Berkeley Hills area. Um, and then this here is the campus area. Um, the Sierra Club. Um, so John Muir spent um, quite a bit of time in, um, in Berkeley. And um, here's a photo of LeConte and um, also under the American flag, some of the, um, a, a party that the Sierra Club had together. It's actually a photo of, of, from um, uh, LeConte. So the LeConte brothers um, worked at, at Berkeley. Joseph LeConte was the um, was the more famous of them, and um, he's actually uh, uh, scientists. Very commonly at this time, were also um, believed in eugenics. They they sort of took Darwin's theory um, a bit far and thought that um, the white race was the superior race. And because of that, that's why um, the physics building has been unnamed. So what used to be called Le LeConte building is now just the physics building. Um, and um, there are a few buildings um, now on campus where um, they're either, they've either been unnamed or they will be unnamed because um, if you look back and see <clears throat> racist writings or um, not, you know, dastardly deeds, then you don't want to have a na uh, building named after that person. So um, there's a committee on campus that adjudicates that. Um, but just, you know, so great that um, Berkeley um, folks were at the beginning of the Sierra Club, um, important uh, for the environmental movement and this save, saving the, the redwoods and the um, Yosemite National Park and all of, uh, the other things, but also intertwined with that was this um, superiority, and of course, of course, not even in consideration to the natives who this was their land, and they were they were excellent stewards of the land, and um, that's you know the the newcomers were not such good stewards. Um, in 1899, Phoebe Hurst, Phoebe Apperson Hurst, uh, um, commissioned a worldwide contest uh, for the very best design of campus. Um, and she, what she wanted to do is um, attract all the best architects in the world with a prize. Um, and um, and um, the best architects at the time were uh, Parisians. Uh, and so um, she went on a tour around Europe and uh, and um, you know offered prize money. This is actually a design from Emile Bernard, the winner. Um, Emile Bernard was a very famous um, still very famous um, architect from Paris. And so you can see that this campus isn't quite um, what we have. <laughs> uh, first of all, the Hill Campus, there's this huge espalon. That's not what it looks like now. And you can see all this uh, open space in the middle. Um, and then the Campanile is uh, in a different place or what, what would become the Campanile. Um, what happened, um, as the story goes, um, is that uh, after Emile Bernard won the prize, um, then Phoebe Hurst offered him a, quite a bit of money to actually oversee the building of his design, and he turned it down. And um, the rumor is that he turned it down because, one, he couldn't get a decent cup of coffee in Berkeley, so we know that's changed. <laughs> but at this time, um, California was considered an outback of, you know, Hicks and not a place of great civilization like Paris. And so there was kind of a snob appeal um, or maybe lack of snob appeal um, for 
he didn't want to he didn't want to live in a place where he couldn't get a good cup of cup of coffee and then the other thing is that he that the rumor is that he's very afraid of grizzly bears so there were grizzly bears all over berkeley and um and that's why we have you know the name grizzly peak now and uh, the last grizzly bear was shot in california in 1924 um uh, but before the campus was built, um, grizzly bears just roamed everywhere. Um, and like I said, they were the apex um, predator um, and before they were all shot. Uh, this is the Rad Lab. The cyclotron was built in 1932. Um, and um, this is uh, uh, where our Nobel laureate prizes began. Um, so, um, the first, our first Nobel laureate was um, Ernest Lawrence, and he won in 1939, he won the uh, physics Nobel Prize. Uh, this was, um, at one point, the cyclotron was um, about the size of a guitar case, um, and the idea was to spin atoms around in a, in a, like a figure eight to split them. Um, this is why we have so many uh, of the, uh, if you look at the periodic table, I think there's, um, I think it's 10 or 12, I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly, but many of the elements were main, named by Berkeley scientists because um, this is where all of that, uh, you know, atomic um, atom splitting all started. Um, so they, this is the, when they built the cyclotron up on the top of the hill, this was, uh, this was where, you know, the, the, the cyclotron was as big as a building. And, um, this was the beginning also that re realizing the power of um, harnessing the power of atoms for nuclear energy, actually they thought it would have medicinal purposes. Um, so they were, they didn't realize that they were working on what become um, eventually would become the um, atom bomb and then nuclear bombs. Um, this is a time when they were excited about, um, well, mostly health purposes, but also energy purposes they thought. Um, so one of the things that came out of this um, Berkeley being the forerunners with this, oh, by the way, this is a line of eucalyptus trees that shows the property marking. Um, so now where the the um, the Hill campus has done quite a bit to take down many of the eucalyptus because they're so dangerous in wildfires. So um, not all of those still are there. We still have lots of eucalyptus, but um, many of those have been taken down. Um, so the Cold War, um, Berkeley was actually one of the most spied upon areas um, for of Soviet spies. So they weren't completely wrong when they were worried about uh, Soviet spies um, finding out nuclear uh, secrets by coming to campus. And um, um, before Jake Edgar Hoover, the campus was pretty open and it, you know people could go to the cafeteria where all the physicists hung out and maybe make friends and and that's what actually what happened is that they um they soviets were finding out um secrets from um, people like oppenheimer um, by the way there's an oppenheimer movie coming out soon um starring matt damon they were shooting it on campus last year <laughs> so some of you may have seen the film crews there um so that will if you're interested in that you'll find out more about um the whole story here but um very concerned that that faculty and staff would be passing along secrets to the Soviets. And so they came up with the loyalty oath. This is the, during the McCarthy era. So um, 157 staff and faculty were fired for refusing to sign this oath. Uh, and um, that was in, um, in uh, 1949. And then uh, eventually in 1952, the California Supreme Court overturned this and, and ordered the university to hire back all of those faculty and staff that were fired um, then. Um, but this was really, you know, where the Cold War was really, um, you know, part of the part of the culture uh, here. And there were, um, there's a building that's on the corner of Center and Shattuck. Um, it's the, um, it's one of the bank buildings across from the Wells Fargo Bank. Uh, it's, um, they actually had FBI and CIA uh, offices there, and that was to sp spy on the faculty and students and staff. Um, then World War II, um, Berkeley um, became um, one of the places where lots of people came from, especially from the South, to work on the armaments. Uh, and uh, 
um, this is um, uh, a cartoon and there's a photo of Betty Reed Soskin. Um, she was a staff member. And so this is, you know, this presentation is for staff. So she was a staff member at, uh, at, at Berkeley. And um, then, but she's most famous for um, being a national park ranger at the Rosie Riveter Museum in Richmond. Um, great tour, by the way, if you ever wanna go. Um, she went on to write books. Um, she just turned 101. Um, she's been widely celebrated. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so that's part of Berkeley's history too. Um, in fact, the, where the, um, uh, where the international students now live on San Pablo, that used to be a, a whole bunch of housing for um, a lot of workers at the at the um, at the armament, armaments factories. I'll, actually, it was a, 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 a large number of uh, black families lived there, and then uh, they used eminent domain to university used eminent domain to um, take that land and tear down the houses, and and that's become student housing, student family housing. Uh, along came Clark Kerr. Uh, Clark Kerr was uh, responsible for the uh, master plan of 1960. Um, so he was a um, pioneer of higher education. He had a, a plan for the multiversity uh, and the idea that um, the university was the place to um, fire up young minds and um, create uh, industry. He was an economist. So the idea of being efficient and having all kinds of majors and options for young people to become professionals. Um, and this was part of the expansion of the UCs. Uh, of, and his master plan was to have the UCs be the R1 research institutions. And, and then under them, um, the CSUs, Cal State Universities, where um, uh, the, idea, the mission for them was to create teachers for um, K through 12. Uh, in addition to other topics. And um, every UC started out with a certain, like agriculture was UC Davis. So if you look in the history of every UC, um, but UC Berkeley was the first. Um, and so this plan was made at UC Berkeley. Um, and then he became the president of the whole system. Uh, and, and of course, community colleges, the idea that anybody in California could, um, without a high school diploma even, could go to community college um, and then transfer to uh, Cal State University or uh, UC, UC uh, University of California um, College, and then go all the way up to getting a PhD and becoming a professor and becoming an expert. So this was the engine of California's um, uh, growth and um, innovation. And uh, and also, by the way, I'm not going to talk too much about uh, um, People's Park, but there's a really great mural right next to People's Park. And it shows how Clark Kerr was really caught. He was the enemy of the students during the People's Park demonstrations, but then he also got fired by Ronald Reagan, who had just become governor. Uh, Ronald Reagan, um, one um, one of one of his stump speeches was um, was um, I'm going to um, take care of that mess in Berkeley. <laughs> so all the student protests in Berkeley, uh, he was um, against, and he felt that uh, Clark Kerr was too much too much on the left and too much sympathizing with the students. So um, Clark Kerr was actually an enemy of the students uh, and Ronald Reagan during the uh, People's Park demonstrations. Uh, this is a fun story. Uh, these uh, women, um, Kay Kerr, uh, Sylvia McLaughlin, es Esther Gulick were wives of faculty members and um, Kay Kerr was Clark Kerr's wife, right? And so they they um, they from their Berkeley houses in the Berkeley Hills, uh, they could see the garbage trucks going down every day and dumping uh, raw raw garbage right into the bay, which happened all around the bay. And um, and this was a time when it was the bay was considered something that you could just fill in and create more land and more housing, um, part of growth, and that was. So to fill in the bay was a good idea at this time, but they saw this pollution from their houses and um, they are called the almond cookie revolutionaries because they would make almond cookies at their houses and have meetings about how can we save the bay. There's an organization now called Save the Bay, thanks to them. And uh, this uh, campaign, they asked for people to send donations of a dollar and um, they raised enough money to um, actually um, influence the government. And here you see 
Ronald Reagan um, signing the bill, um, the first of many bills um, to save the Bay. And now um, the Bay Conservation has actually changed what was really polluted, um, a really polluted Bay into, you know, I don't know uh, if it's a great idea to eat fish right out of the Bay, but people do. So that shows you how much has changed um, thanks to um, the um, uh, people in the in the 60s and then of course in the 70s that became um, aware of how important it is to protect the environment. And just a, a side note about the environment, um, the bay actually is a different shape than it was before the gold rush. So this is um, um, after panning when um, big investors got involved with the gold rush um, and the later gold is harder, harder to find. And so they used hydraulics and they basically used water to just like decimate hillsides. Um, and then all of that silt um, from, from the hydraulics washed into the bay. And so here's, um, you can see how much of the bay filled in um, from all of these tons and tons and tons of silt that came down the Sacramento River um, and filled in the bay. Um, so you can see that the the um, outline of the bay has changed. Um, and um, yeah, and also like Berkeley used to have a sandy beach and now it isn't. And also there just used to be plenty of tons of fish and um, they're just the, the environment is completely different than it was before the gold rush. Um, so the gold rush really was um, an environmental catastrophe for the bay. They actually had plans to fill in the whole bay and there was just gonna be like a, a small inlet that went from um, the Golden Gate Bridge um, or from the Golden Gate entrance um, to the um, Oakland, the Port of Oakland. And so part of filling in the bay was they were going to make um, a plan. Um, there was Kaiser, <laughs> Kaiser, Kaiser Hospital proposed having an international airport <laughs> built. So this is from um, 1943. So um, part of the, um, the, the environmental movement stop, put a stop to this. And also um, we have a, uh, I've got, I wanna talk a little bit about um, a, a, the backstory behind, behind the free speech movement. So um, Berkeley of course is very, very proud of the free speech movement. We're known worldwide for um, free speech movement and all of the demonstrations that are now regular, you know, happenings on the, you know, the Berkeley campus. Um, but I wanted to give the backstory because it's not often told. Um, the idea of peaceful protest and sit-ins actually started with the black, um, historically black um, colleges and universities in the South. And in uh, 1960, um, this is the Woolworths and, and Greensboro, the sit-in. This is where it all started. These students were very organized. They tested each other so that they could be put, they would put up to be, would be meetings and being shouted in the face and the idea was that, and they, you know, they told the manager of Woolworths what we're doing. They talked to the police department, just everybody. They were really organized. In other words, this wasn't just a, you know, let's just do this today. This was something that was planned months in advance. They're very, very organized and, and um, had in mind how they wanted to do peaceful demonstration. They were, um, this this was learned from Gandhi and Martin Luther King. Uh, this was just up, he was not quite famous yet here in 1960, um, but he actually learned, learned a lot by working with these students um, and then eventually became the leader. Um, but um, these students actually preceded him in, in, um, in putting together these um, demonstrations. So um, in that started what were called the Freedom Rides, which were bus rides through the South. Um, and it was mostly actually white college students that ended up going on these, but it was organized by the black students from the historically black colleges and universities. And they went throughout the South and um, and went to places where um, black people weren't were discouraged or were locked out of voting. Um, Mississippi was probably the most egregious place because um, basically there was no way a black person could pass the test. They would, they made it so there were subjective answers and they would just say, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't pass the, you know, you can't vote here if you didn't pass the, the test. Um, and so um, Mississippi summer um, was the summer of 1964. And that was when um, Mario Savio and, and several other UC Berkeley students um, went to, spent their summer registering 
um, um, black people to vote in the South um, on these taking these buses. And this is really where the, the idea of the free speech movement started because uh, Mario Savio and the other stu Berkeley students were learning about peaceful protest and the importance of organization and um, civil rights. Um, and so they brought this knowledge back with them. Mario Savio uh, was beat up by the Ku Klux Klan. Um, he and a friend, another um, white student were beat up and um, his, his friend was really badly injured. But three uh, young men actually lost their lives. The Ku Klux Klan killed them and threw them in a ditch. Um, and so this was news over the summer um, of 1964. So you can imagine when classes started in 1964, uh, this was on everybody's minds. So these are the three um, college students who um, were, they were missing and then they were found um, dead a few weeks later um, and by the Ku Klux Klan. So, this was um, 19, summer of 1964. Um, fall of 1964 was also when uh, IBM punch cards. So it was, we were on the quarter system. And so uh, what, what happened to this is that, um, this is the first year the baby boomers started college. So um, uh, this is the time when um, Unit one, two, three, and four were built um, in order to accommodate the baby boomers who were going to, their first wave was coming to classes. So all of a sudden, thousands more students were ex ex expected in the fall of 1964. And uh, they, um, um, and they, this is the house of the, they decided, okay, well, let's use computer technology to sign people up for classes. So you have this huge upswell in number of students. Um, eminent domain was used to build out Sproul Plaza and um, where the Martin Luther King um, Student Union is now, um, that used to be shops and, um, you know, it was part of the city of Berkeley and that eminent domain was used to take over that. And then the blocks where um, a, the box of residential housing where units one, two, three, and four were built. The reason you don't, there was no unit four is because that's actually People's Park, that block um, you, eminent domain was used to um, to bulldoze homes there. Um, uh, people moved out, they were given the face value of their houses, they bulldozed homes and then they ran out of money. So they used eminent domain to get that piece of property but then they never built on it. Um, so that's kind of the part, uh, part of the, the story of People's Park. But anyway, so, the, so there was kind of like, okay, brand new plaza, Frau Plaza, people in long lines with punch cards, and then some of these um, students coming back from Mississippi summer thinking, okay, we really um, want to organize here. Um, and the, the other thing that was um, that was happening at this time um, was that uh, the uh, Dean of Students, um, Dean Towell, of, um, she uh, had said students could not, she reminded the students and told with the new Sproul Plaza, that students couldn't have political material on campus, that they had to go all the way to Telegraph. And now with this plaza built out, you know, they were even further from Sather Gate. So it was typical um, for people to have political material outside of Sather Gate. Um, but the idea was that it wasn't allowed inside Sather Gate. But now with Pla Sp uh, Sprout Plaza built out, now it was only allowed on, um, on Telegraph, not on campus. So at the first day of class, there was a Daily Cal, Cal article about you know, reminding students you cannot have political material on campus. And this was the perfect opening for these students who were learning about civil rights. Well, the First Amendment is the right to free speech. So the first civil right. Um, and so they decided that they, they were going to tweak, uh, to, you know, to, um, to, to tweak the noses of um, the administrators and show that no, the First Amendment right is our right. We can have free speech on campus, we could have political material. And here you see the students of, for the Democratic Society setting up right in front of say their gate, which was then after this plaza was built, it was on campus. Um, so they were there and they also set up on the steps of um, Sproul uh, Hall. Um, and uh, the, there was, um, the administration want, didn't want students to do this. What they did is they arrested um, well, for, first of all, they said they were going to um, dismiss students, um, and that didn't stop um, uh, stop the students from still continuing with their protests by having their tables um, on Sproul Plaza. 
Uh, so then um, the administration decided they would want to make an um, example of this one tall graduate student named Jack Weinberg. And so they sent a, a cop car from down, this is before UCPD, um, a police car from City Hall that came and um, and put him in the back seat. But the thing is that, well, first of all, remember there's so many people getting registered and just so many people on Sproul Plaza was built for it being a, a plaza, like a European plaza where everybody meets and uh, congregates. And so um, apparently just nearby um, this, you can see this, this, the, um, this, this structure that's still there um, on Sproul Plaza where people get their lunches now. <laughs> um, but anyway, they, what they what the, uh, when they saw the student saw that there was the student being arrested. Um, story goes that somebody called out, "Sit down, I can't see," and it automatically turned into this great, huge sit-in that blocked the the uh, the cop car in for thirty six hours. And then what happened then is that people, um, anybody in the crowd, could take your shoes off um, and go to the top of the um, police car and. Um, and, uh, you know, make any speech you wanted. And Mario Savio, who's kind of a shy guy, but he had been in the Mississippi uh, summer and he was quite active, um, especially with um, black voting rights and black rights. Um, uh, it was one of his top issue. Um, and um, he was also very eloquent. So he just, um, because of his eloquence, became the leader of the free speech movement. Um, while this was happening, the students negotiated with administrators and said, if you agree to our demands for free speech on campus, then we will ask everybody to leave and the cop car can do that. And so they did make an agreement. And so then, you know, everybody went home after sitting out there, I guess they would take shifts and switch off so they could uh, go to classes or go to get something to eat. But they they pretty much, had, you know, had this, you know, couple hundred people sitting there blocking the, the, the police car from moving. Um, then the camp, the administrators did not follow up um, it did not make good on their promises after this day. And so that there was another, um, uh, there was another big demonstration. And um, this is, um, so you can see Joan Baez, she um, saying we shall overcome and, and the students are filling all four floors of Sproul Hall and the steps. So they had this big um, slumber party and they'd also learned like how to make your body go limp when um, being taken out and they fully expected to be arrested. This is still, still, <laughs> it's the ma biggest mass arrest of from peaceful protest in the world, and still, um, that stands. Um, so, uh, this is uh, uh, December third. So, it was at the towards the end of the quarter, um, and uh, there's, um, uh, yeah, they were using nonviolent tactics, and so you can see the police dragging them out um, on Sproul Plaza. There was a line of um, paddy wagons of police buses, um, and uh, they basically dragged everybody out and put them in a police bus. And so that was um, this huge, huge, huge mass arrest. They were sent to Santa Rita jail um, and um, kind of roughed up and everything. Anyway, it was a big shame. Uh, you know, this is a world that got world attention and the faculty were really ashamed that here the students were just asking for their first amendment free speech rights. And so on December 8th, the faculty met and they decided they voted um, in favor of the students. And since UC Berkeley faculty is the most powerful force in Berkeley, <laughs> it's the, I don't know of any other faculty that has as much power as UC Berkeley faculty and they always have had a lot of power. But anyway, they voted to support the students. And just so starting in September to December, this was um, just three months, the students were completely successful free speech movement had been won. And then they went to uh, winter break and then they got back in January. And then January is when they had a big um, rally at Sproul Plaza to say, okay, we won free speech, speech. Now we need to use our efforts to protest that war in Vietnam. And so um, those re regular protests on Sproul Plaza that had st started in the fall of 1964, continued in 1965 and beyond against uh, the, the Vietnam War. So that's kind of more of the, the images we have of, of the Vietnam War protests and counterculture. That was more uh, late 60s and 70s. Um, and, but it started, everything started with this free speech movement. Of course, Pro uh, Sproul Plaza is still ground zero 
for any big um, protests. Um, there are four or five um, helicopter uh, uh, um, that, that that are um, on call um, um, in the Bay Area for the news stations. So whenever there's a, anticipated a big protest, um, there'll be four or five helicopters overhead taking um, taping, taking video footage to show across the world. And so if there was something that happened tomorrow, that's what we can expect is to hear those helicopters overhead that will tell us that this is gonna be international news again. Um, and also I just wanted to, sh to share uh, before we, um, uh, we're gonna take a, a quick break with a quiz, but I um, also wanted to talk about the Black Panthers who came, um, Black Panthers were um, founded in 1966 and they were actually founded in Berkeley and Oakland. Most people just know that Oakland part. Um, and what they did is they had this, um, that they, there was a lot of um, police brutality and shootings in Oakland. Well. It's you know no no surprise to us now that we know um, thanks to Black Lives Matter we really understand about brutality of, of police um, against Black communities, um, but this was the way for them to um, to create their own social services. Um, so not only protecting um, their neighborhoods um, with um, patrols. But also, um, this is the uh, free breakfast program, um, which now is a national program. So it started with the Black Panthers in Berkeley and Oakland, where they um, they um, provided uh, free breakfast for all children. But also, they had health care. They basically set up their own social services. So we know them more for the defense, and um, uh, they have. There's a really um, interesting story about how they started in 1966. Um, um, uh, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, um, they decided that they the First Amendment check from the free speech movement, let's, let's focus on the Second Amendment, which is the right to bear arms. And um, of course, they weren't supposed to have, or we weren't allowed to have, or um, violence would be, <laughs> would, would violence could be created against them, but they weren't allowed to defend themselves with their own guns. So white people could carry guns, but black people couldn't in essence. And so they were trying to protest that. And so what they decided to do is buy their own guns. And that was, those are the, some of the images we know of the Black Panthers. By the way, the, the animal, the Black Panther, the belief was that Black Panther only attacks when attacked. So it's an, only a defensive animal. And that's why they chose the Black Panther as their, as their image, as their mascot. Um, anyway, so they decided to get their own guns and defend themselves and they needed money to get their own guns. So this is the time when Mao was on the rise and Mao's little red book was available for sale in mass quantities in Chinatown. And so they went to Chinatown and would buy a whole big bulk box of, of little red books for like 25, 35 cents each. And then they went to um, Sproul Plaza, in Berkeley campus, and they sold to Berkeley students for a dollar. And they used their profits, their proceeds, um, to buy um, to buy their first guns. So that's how they got started. Um, one um, other um, amazing hero in our um, in in our uh, Berkeley history is Mark Binham, Bingham. Um, so if you see the date that he died, September 11th, um, he was on um, Flight 93. He was one of the men that um, knew what was happening. Um, knew. Uh, his mom had called him and told him that that the other planes had crashed into the um, the towers in um, New York City, and that that she was sure his plane was being used. I think his plane was supposed to go to the Pentagon. I can't remember, but anyway, um, so she told him, and so he and some others realized what what was happening, um, and they um, went. They stormed the um, the pilot room and 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 um, uh, and um, basically. Um, that's why the, the plane crashed in Pennsylvania. So he was one of the heroes. Um, he was um, gay and and he announced that he was gay. He was not, um, he was out from the beginning and um, on his graduation, he um, announced the public. He was a captain and a, a rugby star at Cal. Very um, gentle, wonderful leader. All Everybody knew him and admired him. After he graduated, he headed up um, many, um, uh, you know, the the rugby teams in the Bay Area and, and participated in international tournaments, um, became a really um, um, strong businessman in the community. So just very, very well loved. Um, and so, um, yeah, and this is a, a photo of him in front of the Cal Stadium. So he was a, 
a really important figure. And it, it's just a, it's an, another point of pride that we can say that um, at this time when the rest of the planet wasn't very accepting of gay people, he could be um, proud and out here on the Berkeley campus. And um, so we have that, and he's a, an American hero. Um, so um, with that, we're gonna take a bit of a break. Um, so I'm just going to play um, the Melissa Etheridge's song um, about him. Um, so let's get that up here. And- um, I actually wrote this in Europe. This, this song. is a tribute to Mark uh, It was right after 9-11. And I was, what was I doing over in Europe? I think I was just touring and I was making a Lucky album. And um, I remember I, I wanted to, I wanted to write a song about 9-11. I wanted to write a song about, you know, just to kind of put it in, put it down as an artist would in history, you know? And I uh, I remember of all the stories that came out, of course, of that that tragic, tragic day. That morning, I remember waking up in, in Dallas, Texas. I had to, I was gonna do a show that night and um, then fly home the next day, but there were no flights. So I ended up uh, hopping onto my crew bus and coming back to Los Angeles. It was, it was very different things, weren't quite the same after that. Um, but hearing all the, the stories and of course was was just like everyone else inspired by the story of Flight 93 where the heroes on that flight uh, all came together to stop the hijackers from from uh, ramming the, uh, the plane into what everyone thought would be the uh, Capitol building. But um, instead they all perished in a field and they brought the, the plane down and as uh, the story started coming out, the story of Mark Bingham, a wonderful gay man, rugby player, big, strong, proud gay man, um, was one of the heroes, one of the, the four, you know, that said, come on, let's roll. And um, I started to notice, this is, you know, 2001. I start, started to notice uh, that the stories one by one kept leaving out the fact that he was gay, kept leaving out, you know, that story. And I, I wanted to make sure that that got told. I wanted to make sure that the, the world remembered not only Mark Bingham, but his life and, and how we as a gay community had a hero. We had a hero, bona fide hero coming out of 9-11. So I, wrote this song. I'm going. I wrote this song to a, a loop first. And the loop was of an artist named Ella Jenkins. You can hear her. And she sings, up and down this road I go. Skipping and a dodging. Skipping and a dodging. Up and down this road I go Skipping and a dodging To the 44 Now, that little piece of music that, that piece of her that we sampled Is from a civil rights song She was a civil rights singer An amazing woman out of uh, Illinois Close to Chicago And it it had the feeling of it, the civil rights feeling of, you know, skipping and a dodging the 44, you know, and what they were going through in the South at the time of the civil rights movement in the 60s. And I, I wanted to marry those two things to kind of understand that the LGBT civil rights were, were as deep and meaningful. So that's why you have up and down this road I go, skipping in a dodge, skipping in a dodge, up and down this road I go, skipping in a dodge from a 44 
1003 on a Tuesday morning In the fall of an American dream A man is doing what he knows is right On flight 93 He loved his mom and he loved his dad He loved his home and he loved his man but on that bloody Tuesday morning, he died an American. Now you cannot change this, and you can't erase this. You can't pretend this is not. schools because who he wants to love is breaking your God's rules he stood up on a Tuesday morning in the chair he was brave and he made his choice and without a doubt a hundred lives he must have stayed Now you cannot change this I get <laughs> I always get emotional hearing her and hearing that song it's pretty meaningful um okay so yeah so um just um coming back from the break I wanted to share a quiz with you um yeah, we'll talk a little bit more after the quiz um just to close out the, I want to talk about some things that we're proud of now and some things we're ch challenged by now 
Um, but I wanted to um, do a, a bit of a quiz here as a as a as a break. Um, so see if you can answer this questions. There's five questions. So here's number one. Uh, what is UC Berkeley most famous for? Please check all that are true. The free speech movement, uh, the first experiments in atomic energy, writing the best opportunity for social mobility in the world, being the best public university in the world, hungry squirrels. <laughs> so the answer is all of the above. Um, just this past August, uh, Forbes, Forbes ranked UC Berkeley as the second best university in the world, not just, it's it's every year we get the um, best public university, but um, last year they um, they had us ranked number one. Um, what they were doing was using the Obama administration's education department's new ways of looking uh, at universities as um, vehicles for social mobility. And so um, if you look at that, you'll see that UC Berkeley is does an amazing job, as we know, of um, um, having students who come from working class backgrounds or middle class backgrounds and uh, really getting the best education and therefore improving their uh, their social mobility. Um, <clears throat> there's a, an article in the Daily Cal that you can look at um, about that. So we're actually tied with Stanford this year. <laughs> okay, so, so question number two. Why is the grizzly bear the mascot of UC Berkeley? Please check all that are true. Uh, because huge numbers of grizzly bears lived in Berkeley because it was campus designer Emil Bernard's famous, favorite animal. Because a grizzly bear is on the California state flag. Because grizzly bear, because a grizzly bear led the first Europeans into Berkeley. Uh, because before guns, grizzly bears were the apex predator in California. Okay. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> All are correct except for one. So Emil Bernard, we talked about this, did, absolutely did not like beers. Um, he turned down the additional prize money to go to campus and, and the rumor was he was afraid of bears. <laughs> um, he also um, complained that the we didn't have good coffee. Um, and then of course, Paris had the best coffee at that time and now we're caught, we've caught up to Paris. Okay, number three, uh, check the statements that are true about Strawberry Creek. Uh, Strawberry Creek was teeming with salmon and trout 200 years ago. Um, Strawberry Creek was the first name feature in the San Francisco Bay Area. Strawberry Creek is now too polluted for, fr for fish. And Strawberry Creek, Creek is used as a classroom for classes at UC Berkeley. Okay, and all are correct except for um, Strawberry Creek is now the cleanest it's been for a century. So Strawberry Creek, um, up until the 70s, um, just like we we're throwing our trash into the bay, um, people just threw trash into Strawberry Creek. So that was, it's just a, an American Californian thing to use waterways for trash and refuse uh, up until the 70s when the envir movement, environmental movement began. Um, so now there are fish and there are little crawdads and little things in the, it's nothing, it's not the trout and the salmon, the huge uh, river that it used to be, but the creek um, has live things and that actually uh, students study those uh, critters. Um, so, you know, it's making a comeback. Um, so that's actually a, a very positive story of what change can do. Okay, number four, what year did you see Berkeley admit women? 1870, 1868, 1911, 1920. So um, the answer is 1870. Um, and the idea was that, you know how we looked at um, North and South Hall, they were completed in 1873. So the idea was to admit women on time for them to be able to uh, have the buildings to go to. Um, and they were um, training to be teachers. Uh, you might recognize the other dates. So 1868 is when we were founded and when UC Berkeley was founded. Um, 1911 is when women in California won the right to vote. And 1920 is when the 19th Amendment granted all American women the right to vote. Okay, number five. How many Nobel Prizes does Berkeley have? Hmm. 
a lot. <laughs> okay. In total, Berkeley faculty is, have won uh, 51 Nobel Prizes. Uh, currently, there are 10 Nobel laureates. Um, there, If you've seen on center campus, the, there's parking signs that say NL for Nobel laureate. So um, you can have a have free parking space if you won, win a Nobel Prize. So get busy. <laughs> And we're sure to have more. We have so many brilliant people on campus. And so I'm sure that there'll be more to come. And um, there's a tiebreaker. How many chicks and grand chicks does Annie the Falcon have? So if you've been watching the, was this last summer was very, um, in spring was like a soap Falcon soap opera on the top of the Campanile bell tower. Um, so some people were watching the Falcon cam pretty much every day when um, the Falcon chicks were born and there was just a lot of drama over the summer. You can read all about it in the Daily Cal, past Daily Cal articles and actually a lot of Bay Area um, news outlets were covering this. So she has, um, she's hatched 15 chicks and then uh, those chicks have gone on to have grand chicks. So there's not a number of, nobody knows how many grand chicks she has because they're presumably spread out all over California by now, <laughs> but she could have great grand chicks even. So grand chicks, and then even those grand chicks could be having chicks now. So one of her chicks died. Um, so that so um, that's why the number is 15. Um, so you can check out the webcam every spring. So she has a, a new partner. Um, this year. So um, we'll see if she has chicks again, but every May you can look forward to seeing all the action on the webcam. Okay, and for, um, let's see. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll, by the way, there's a lot of um, great links um, and I'll make sure that to provide all the links um, to this these materials um, so that you can have this and review more of this information. Okay, now we're gonna just finish out. I wanted to just share a few more um, things about Berkeley before we close out here. And definitely would be happy to answer your questions at the very end, but I want to go on to um, talk about the present day. Oh, but first I wanted to show you the slide because um, I wanted to just, you know, think about uh, why we have, why we're called the California Golden Bears, um, why we Grizzly Bear is our mascot. And um, it's um, possible that Berkeley hosted the biggest population of grizzly bears um, in the whole area. Um, if you think about it, this makes sense. There, the bay and the ocean, uh, Pacific Ocean, were teeming with whales and other large mammals and um, you know fish. And since the Golden Gate is open and straight across from the from Berkeley, the tides come straight to Berkeley. So when a whale would die of natural causes it would wash up on the Berkeley shore. So if you can, you know, and then the bears living up in the hills could absolutely smell the whale and, you know, feast. So having that many whales wash up on the shore could certainly have supported a really large uh, number of grizzly bears. Um, just a little bit about our protest history. Um, the last big controversial protest we we have, or we pretty much have uh, for Earth Day and other environmental protests have been going on, but this was before COVID was the last big kind of controversial one. Ann Coulter came here. Um, she, uh, uh, many people call her a hate speaker. She She's basically provoking people by um, saying nasty things about immigrants and DACA students and um, homosexuals and, you know, whatever. She's, she's very, um, uh, yeah, um, what I guess we'd call a white nationalist nowadays. Um, but uh, we knew about the Proud Boys. She she had Proud Boys as her security um, that that the, when she came here to UC Berkeley, um, Chancellor um, Christ raised um, nearly a million dollars so that we, uh, private donations so that uh, we can have enough security on campus to support whichever speakers come here because the right, uh, the alt-right was, trying to make a statement that um, UC Berkeley was for free speech, but not any free speech. But indeed, this was a way to prove that we would allow free speech, but with enough security. So 
um, she her speech went ahead. There weren't very many people in the audience actually, um, um, and the but the Proud Boys were with her, so we knew all about the Proud Boys before before January sixth. And yeah, still, like I said, the helicopters are ready to come here anytime there's a big um, issue to protest. We can count on people knowing that Berkeley is going to be um, where protest occurs. Uh, okay. And just wanted to say a little bit about um, housing and redlining. Housing is Berkeley's number one issue. Um, and um, redlining um, was um, something that affects all big cities throughout the United States. Um, you could see the corridors of transportation were, were put in redline districts. So redline districts meant that uh, families there couldn't get loans, they couldn't uh, buy their own property, with, get bank loans, and um, therefore those neighborhoods um, were neglected and they were also the easiest for um, public transportation to be run through because um, because the value was less and, and because the political power was less. So um, it's, this is part of our legacy today. Um, and um, you can see here um, in the Claremont district, um, people who are not Caucasian were not allowed to live in this area. Um, so um, that legacy, it continues today. And um, it's something that our city council is working on. It's also part of the story of, um, how important it is for UC Berkeley to provide plenty of housing for students. And um, now you can see cranes all over Berkeley working on, on housing, um, but we would say definitely that's our issue and our challenge is to um, right the wrongs of the past and also make sure that our students have enough housing. And we have, uh, so Jennifer Doudna um, won in 2020 um, for, she won the Nobel um, uh, Laureate Prize uh, for her uh, work in gene editing and CRISPR technology. And um, also wanted to point out that we are trying to address um, the fact that the um, first museum holds so many native, um, uh, so many native remains. Um, Cafe Alone, which was on Bancroft before the pandemic is now on, on campus um, where the Crowbear, uh, um, uh, next to the Crowbar Library and where the there's a there's a courtyard the Crowbar courtyard is now that that building's been unnamed um, but there's a, a cafe Aloni there now um, this is a picture from when they were on Bancroft but um, you can go there for tea or for lunch or for dinner and learn all about um, the Aloni culture and um, uh, try, taste the foods and uh, learn a little bit of the language and uh, I just put a picture of Crowbar, what it was like before. So this, you, it, you could see this is the um, patio area where um, um, where the Cafe Aloni is now. And also Anthony Hall, which um, is also called the Pelican Building, it's a big Pelican statue in front, used to be a, um, it used to be the Pelican Humor Magazine and then it was um, the student union was there. And now the building's been um, given to the native community um, to use as they wish for the next several years. And so if you go there now, that's where the um, native um, cultural center is. And um, <clears throat> um, you may have heard there was a, a great NPR uh, just a couple of days ago, an NPR show that uh, was about admissions and how how we're really doing great a great job at um, having diversity while not um, um, well, well, basically, um, uh, finding finding ways forward without without um, violating Proposition two hundred nine and without with the um, different cases that they're going to the Supreme Court now, we found a way that's become a model for the whole country, and basically, it's by looking for instances of excellence across all the applicants. Um, so um, Femi is the name, the Associate Vice Chancellor of Enrollment, Femi is well known on campus and um, he was the star of this NPR show the other day and uh, definitely is make us all pr proud of, of our diversity. So I'm just ending up here with, um, yeah, just what uh, your challenge, how do you want to contribute to UC Berkeley's ongoing quest for social justice? 
thank you for all what all you do as staff and all that you're doing to make us great for now and and I'm sure in continuing in the future. I hope this presentation has um, been an inspiration for um, all of us to feel pr proud of UC Berkeley and being the staff person at UC Berkeley, um, but also a, you know a challenge to continue um, that pride and continue to work on the, the things that we want to work on to make ourselves the best that we can be. So thanks very much. And thanks again, Omar, for being here and uh, really appreciate everybody um, participating. So that really, it's been um, great to have you and thanks so much. <laughs>